to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Lord said they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. Luke chapter 14, verse number 18. We welcome you today to our study of excuses. How does God feel about my excuses and yours? What does the Bible say about man's excuses not to do what God wants him to do? We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God for our authority today. Again, today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area, they would love for you to stop by and visit their worship service. If you come to worship on Sunday, Sunday night, Bible study, you will find a group of people there who are concerned about the truth, who love God, and who want to help men and women get to heaven. And so we encourage you to check out the Church of Christ in your area. If you'd like to have a Bible study, you'd like to know more about God's Word or the church or salvation, whatever the subject may be, you'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Scriptures with you. Friend, we'd also love to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Check out our apps for both Android and iPhone. Check us out on Facebook, other social media. You'll find us there as well. If you need a copy of today's lesson, you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our previous lessons, visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. It's a great way to study with God's Word. We have all kinds of material, Old Testament lessons, New Testament, topical lessons, wide variety of good Bible study material, and it's all free of charge. If you need a DVD or a CD or would like to get one of our lessons for download, just go to our website, fill out the media request form. We'll be glad to send that to you in whatever way that you need that. And as always, our hope and prayer is simply to point men and women to the Word of God and to encourage people to live a life that's pleasing to God. Today we're thinking about a subject that is probably very relevant to all of us. Someone once said, excuses are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one and they're pretty much useless. You know, isn't that about right? A lot of us are good at making excuses. If we don't want to do something, we want to put something else ahead. We're not wanting to be involved in that. Boy, we can come up with a hundred and one reasons not to do it. I hate doing socks in the laundry. I don't mind doing the laundry, but I hate doing socks. I can find 101 reasons not to fold my socks and deal with them, but in reality, they're all just excuses. What about when it comes to putting God first? What about when it comes to doing what we know God wants us to do? Do we sometimes make excuses? Did anybody in the Bible ever make excuses? I want you to take your New Testament and I want you to look at the classic example of excuse making. Look in Luke chapter 14 and I want you to see what the scripture says beginning in verse number 16. Then Jesus said to them, A certain man gave a great supper and invited men. And he sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuse. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to the master. The master of the house being angry said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as they commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out 
in the highways and hedges, compelled them to come, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. The picture here is God being the one inviting people to the great supper. That great feast is what we have a privilege to partake in in salvation through Jesus. And all these people making excuses are the reasons they can't obey and the reasons they can't serve. And friend, I want you to think about I want you to think about how terrible these three excuses are. Come to the supper, all things are ready. They all with one accord began to make excuses. Listen to the first. I've bought a piece of land and I need to go see it. What? You bought land without looking at it first? How do you know that it's not full of briars and hedges? How do you know that it's not one big gully? How do you know that it's even worth? Nobody buys land without first looking at it, right? I'm going to lay eyes on it before I even think about buying it. Think about the second person. I have a, a yoke of oxen. I need to go and test it. Please have, I am in a hurry to get behind those mules and go to plowing. At nighttime, when the supper's coming, you're in a big hurry to hook up your mules and plow? Again, who's in such a big hurry to do that, that they'd pass up a free meal? But the third excuse is the worst of all. I have married a wife. I ask you to have me excused. How do I know this is the worst excuse? How many newlyweds do you know that can afford to pass up a free meal? Well, friend, that's a terrible excuse. They can't afford that. All these excuses are just that. They are lies and they are excuses not to come to the supper. You know, man's excuses, they've never pleased God, have they? Exodus 3 and 4, Moses repeatedly made it. Why, uh, here, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Oh, you better send somebody else, God. I'm not a good speaker. Uh, I don't think I could do that. Uh, might be best if you got all these excuses but they began to come out. Moses' excuses didn't please God. Saul's excuses, the excuse as to why he offered sacrifice when he shouldn't have, Samuel delayed, the people were getting a little bit uh, uptight, I just did it because it didn't work. Felix and Agrippa, almost, you persuade me. None of those excuses work. Friend, what about my excuses today? What about your excuses? Are we any different than the people in Luke chapter 14? Are we any different sometimes than Moses or Saul? When we see, when we hear, when we see, when we know we ought to do something and we're in a conflict or we don't want to do it or we don't feel comfortable about it, boy, the excuses begin to roll off our tongue, don't they? Let's talk about some of those excuses today and, and let's consider, am I really doing what I need to or have I let excuse making become my modus operandi for not doing the things I ought to do. What are some excuses people make when it comes to not serving God? The call goes out, the cry goes out, the Lord needs workers, the church needs help, there's good to be done, we need people to help serve. Watch the excuses as they come out. I just don't have the time. Really? You don't have the time? John 9 verse 4, the Bible says, as it relates to time, that we've all got the time to do that. We must work the works of Him who sent us while it is day. For night comes when no man works. Now is the time. Now is the only time you got. But we don't have time. You've got 70, maybe 80 years on this earth, just like everybody else. Psalm 90 verses 10 through 12. Like James 4 verse 14 says, What is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. It's appointed a man once to die and then the judgment. You've got the, I've got the same amount. You've got the same amount of time everybody else has got. 24 hours in a day, 60 hours in a minute, 365 days in a year. What do we mean we don't have the time? Well, here's what we really mean. I don't think I can make the time. I've got too many other things that are jumping ahead of that. I'm too busy. I may not really want to do it. What's the excuse we make sometimes for not serving God? I just don't have the time. When in reality, we've all got the same amount of time. The problem is we don't take advantage of now. Sometimes we procrastinate. 
Like the five foolish virgins in Matthew 25, they knew the bridegroom was coming just like the other five. They didn't have their oil in their lamp. They didn't have it trimmed. When he came, they were caught off guard and they procrastinated and went to get the oil and the door was shut forevermore. Problem is often procrastination. We don't put our priorities first. The rich fool, you fool, this night will your soul be required of you. You had a lot of time to do other stuff but he didn't take advantage of God. Here's what the Bible says. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't say tomorrow. Don't say I'll do it later. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Don't say I'm going to do it another time. Now is the accepted time. We've got to learn to serve God now or we'll have a lot of time in eternity to think about that. The righteous will go away into eternal life, the unrighteous into eternal condemnation. What about when the cry goes out to serve God? Lord need helpers, the church needs helpers, and what other excuses do people make? Sometimes worldliness and greed keeps a lot of people from serving. We're chasing after the world more than we're chasing after God. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Why can't I be at services? Why can't I worship? Why can't I work? Why can't I be involved to help in these things? Is it because we're so busy being worldly and trying to build up and amass stuff of this world that we can't do that? You remember what John said? Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the wicked one. And the world and all it's in, it's one day passing away, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. Why would you want to put your focus and your excuse on something that's passing away? What if you got everything you wanted in this life? What if you got everything you wanted, you had the most money, you had the biggest house, you had the best job, you had the most power, you could be more comfortable than anybody else, and you died and went to hell? What will it profit a man? Gains the whole world, loses his own soul. Mark 8, 36 and 37. You see, don't put your hope in the things of this life. I'm not saying having a job's wrong. I'm not saying having responsibilities wrong. That's not the idea. But friend, if it keeps me from serving God and putting Him first, I need to ask myself, where's my hope? Is my hope in this life? The earth and all that's in it, one day going to cease to exist. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36. 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12. Don't put your hope in world and greedliness and worldliness, all that is passing away, Solomon would say in the book of Ecclesiastes. What's another excuse sometimes we make for not serving God? It's just too demanding. Every time I turn around, somebody's wanting me to do something, it asks too much of me, it's just too demanding of me. Really? Is God too demanding of you? Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul said, I beg you, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. What is my life to be like as a Christian? A living sacrifice. Now, you contrast that, okay? This is such a special and unique term. Living sacrifice would be so foreign to the mind of the Old Testament readers. There were a ton of sacrifices made. There were a, a multiplicity of dead sacrifices made, but a living sacrifice? Is that too demanding? What if Jesus took that same attitude? Come to the world full of sinners? Have people laugh at you and mock you? Be called the chief of the demons? You want people to spit in my face? Too demanding of me. What if the Lord took that attitude? Now, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes, we were healed. Like Jesus, we've really got to get, we've, we've got to come to the point where instead of saying it's too demanding, we're ready to give ourselves completely to God. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Listen now, this is what we're talking about. You are not your own. 
too demanding, you're not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. Better start taking up our cross daily, right? Luke chapter 9, verse 23. We need the attitude of the Apostle Paul for to me to live as Christ. That's what it's about. I'm not saying other people can't help. I'm not saying you've got to do everything all the time. But if my excuse is it's just too demanding, I just don't know that that'll cut it. I'm glad the Lord didn't take that attitude about coming here and doing what He did. And then let's think about another excuse as it relates to these ideas. What excuses sometimes do people make for not obeying the gospel? I talk to a lot of people about becoming Christians, about obeying the gospel, about submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. And over a period of time, I've, I've heard a lot of excuses as to why they wouldn't do that. Let me mention some of the top ones. I remember talking to someone one time and their excuse was, I'm just too sinful. I'm too bad. I've done too many things that are wrong. I just don't think I can be saved. Friend, that's, that may not be an excuse. That may be a faulty idea more than anything. But either way, it's just not true. Listen to these words. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Paul said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Watch it now. Of whom? I am chief. If the chief of sinners can be saved, you can too. You see, sin, there is, it's not like there are levels of all different type of sinners. And by that I mean this. There's sins you can do that are okay, sins you can do that are middle ground, sins you can do that are really bad. That's, that's not the way it works. All sin separates a man from God. Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. At our best, we can say all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Being too sinful, that, that's what Jesus came to save sinners. And all sinners, regardless of whether it's one sin or 500,000 sins, Jesus can save one as well as He can save the other. You can't be too sinful. He is, listen to this, this is what we're talking about. Hebrews 7.25, He is able to save to the uttermost completely those who come to God through Him since He ever lives to make intercession for them. There is not a sin or a sinner so bad that Jesus can't save it. And so don't let your reason, don't let your excuse be, I'm too sinful. If you're willing to change your life, you're willing to turn from that sin, it doesn't matter what you've done. Christ can save you. Then there's another excuse I often hear. Preacher, I know you're right. know what you're saying's right. I believe that to be true, but I'm planning on doing that some other time. Ooh, that one probably scares me the most. Acts 24, verse 25. Felix said, Go away for now. When I've got a more convenient time, I'll call upon you. You know the problem with that? I don't, I'm not promised any more time. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. You know the problem with that? I don't know if Felix ever found that more convenient time, and I know there is no more convenient time than right here, right now. If we say to ourselves, I'm going to do it some other time, we're just kind of pushing it to the back and sweeping it on the rug. And friend, the road to hell is truly probably paved with good. And there's a lot of people. A lot of people who said, one day, I know that's right, I know that's true, I know I need to, and one day, I'm going to obey the gospel. How many of them died before they got the chance to do that? Don't say, I'll do it some other time. You need to obey now what you know now. Some of the saddest words found in all the Bible, I think, are, are made by a man with this same mentality. Acts chapter 26 Verse number 28, you've got Agrippa. And Paul is standing before Agrippa, who is interested in hearing about religious things. And Paul gives this spiel about the gospel of Christ and proves it from the Old Testament and even says to Agrippa, Agrippa, do you believe these things? I know you believe these things. And Agrippa then says in Acts 26, 28, Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul says, I wish you were almost and altogether just like me, a Christian, without these chains. 
What about that almost? Almost won't work. Almost won't even get you close. Almost won't even let you look in the window. Almost, to be almost saved, is to be altogether lost. There is no almost in Christianity. And so here's what we're trying to get across today, friends. That call went out in Luke chapter 14. Everybody's invited. Come to the supper. All things are ready. That is a picture of God pleading with Israel to come and partake of His blessings, be a part of His family, eat at God's table. Everybody began to make excuses. Bought property, I can't do it. Got a team of oxen. I need to go test them, see how good they work. I've just married, married a wife, please excuse me. What about all those excuses? They all, with one accord, began to make excuses. What about today, my friend? I want you to think about your life, and I want you to think about where you are with God. If you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed the gospel, I want to ask you, what excuse are you using? What, when someone says, hey, why have you never become a Christian? How come you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins? What excuse are you going to give? I was too busy? That won't work. I, I had some other things I need to get straight first. Friend, it's not about, listen carefully. Christians come to the Lord because their lives are not perfect. And because they need God's help and because they want to turn from that. If I came to the Lord because my life was already right, that's not the idea. We're not saying everything in your life has got to be perfect. Do you have to repent? Do you have to make up your mind to change? Sure. But I don't, I don't, I don't say to myself, let me get everything right and then I'll come to the Lord. No. The Lord came so they helped me get everything right. And when I come to Him, I don't come perfect, but I come with the mentality I'm ready to do right and I want to follow. And yeah, it's a growth process. Well, I'm just too, I, I, I've got all these other priorities. What's more important than your soul? Listen to me. One day, you're going to leave this life. Like it or not, want to think about it or not, ready for it or not, one day, you're going to leave this life. It is appointed a man once to die and then the judgment. You are going to leave this life and you are going to stand before the almighty throne of God. What are you going to say to God? I had too many other things I needed to do? I had a lot of priorities that really kept pressing on me? I was too busy? None of that will work. You've got to make sure that you become a child of God. And then what about, what about Christians? Probably the worst of all. What about Christians who make excuses for why they can't do what they ought to do? When the church needs help. When, when there's good to be done, when we need help spreading the gospel, what excuse are you going to make? That's just not my talent. Friend, you know the thing about talent? Everybody starts with some. There was a five-talent man, there was a two-talent man, and there was a one-talent man, but there was not a zero-talent man. You may have to hone that talent. You may have to sharpen it. You may have to grow in it. But when we say that's not my talent, I can help out in some way. I may not can do as much or the same as others, but I can find a way for the Lord to use. That's just not my talent. It won't work. Um, family came. I had, I had family commitments. Who's your real family? Who, who are we putting before God? Jesus said, He loves father, mother, brother, sister, husband, or wife, son, or daughter more than me. He is not worthy of me. Well, I got caught up in some... Well, wait a minute now. Where's our priorities? What are we going to think about? Are we really going to give God first place in our life? As we mentioned, Moses, he's a great man of God. Moses, one of the great heroes of the Old Testament, led God's people out of Egypt, led them across the Red Sea on dry land, brought them to the point of the covenant at Mount Sinai, but you read the first about seven chapters of Exodus, and Moses had a problem with excuse making. I'm not a good speaker, and yet Acts 7 says he was trained in speech. Uh, send somebody else, they'd do better. God chose you. Uh, all the excuses that Moses, they won't listen to me. Pharaoh won't know who I am. Nobody will hear me. All, all these other things. Moses had a problem with excuse making. Listen carefully to me. 
when Moses stopped making excuses and started trusting God, that's when Moses became the hero that he was. That's when Moses' life started going on an upward trajectory toward God. Not when he was on the backside of Midian hiding from everything, but when he stopped making excuses for why he couldn't and he just started doing it. That's when Moses' life really took a big turn. What about mine and yours? If I'm going to ever be what God wants me to be, if I'm going to ever grow as a Christian, do more in the church, get out of my comfort zone and be more than I've ever been before, the only way to do that is to stop saying why I think I can't and just get out and do it. And the more you do that, the more you work on it, the more you try, the more you do it, the better you're going to be at it. And so here's our encouragement today. If you're not a Christian, why are you not? Don't make excuses. Don't give all these things you think why. Honestly ask yourself why. And friend, we encourage you today to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you believe He's the Son of God, the Savior of the world? John 8, 24. Would you be willing to turn from a life of sin? Not, not saying you're perfect or that you're always, but would you turn your life over to Him in repentance and try every day to do your best? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess Him as Lord and Savior? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Would you be baptized in water for the remission of your sins? Mark 16, verse 16. And would you get up every day trying to walk in newness of life? Romans 6, verse 4. If you're not a Christian, become one today. Don't make excuses. Just do it. If you are a child of God and maybe you haven't been doing as much as you know you should, maybe you've been making excuses as to why you haven't been serving or working or worshiping, think about that really and ask yourself, is that going to work for me on the day of judgment? Is God really going to accept that or is He going to say to me as well, they all begin to make excuses. Our hope and prayers today will be encouraged to follow God and be faithful to Him and join us next time as we study more together. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.